Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with a delightful top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any future videos. Today's topic explores 10 practical truths about the Father. The truth of God as a personal Father is not introduced until the New Testament while the Lord Jesus is talking with the woman at the well. And why is that? because the Son needed to reveal him to us as his Father. He calls him my Father 53 times in the Gospel, as well as Holy Father, Righteous Father, and my Heavenly Father. Certainly nothing could be more important than the relationship we have with the Father. That's why Christ died. It's time we discovered more. Let's start with number one. The invisible Father can now be exactly seen in the Son. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was made known in flesh. And the idea that the infinite God would come in the form of a little baby and live among us at eye level so that we could see God acting as a carpenter caring for people, and so on. It's just a tremendous truth. And the Lord Jesus said, a little disappointedly, just as he was about ready to leave, when they asked him, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied, and it was like, haven't I been with you such a long time and you haven't known me? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And so when we look at Jesus, we see how beautiful the Father is. People had all sorts of wrong ideas about God in the Old Testament, and one of the reasons Jesus came was to show us how wonderful God is. He thinks the Father is the most lovable person in the universe, and we should too. Number two, God the Father loves you. Yes, God is love, and the Father loves us. It was God who sent the Son to be the Savior, for God so loved the world that he gave his Son. And the idea that when we pray to the Father, we're beggars seeking favor from a despot is not true. The Lord Jesus said, I did not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you. He doesn't need convincing. People sometimes have this false notion that Jesus has to get the Father on our side, but it was the Father who sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And as Jesus says here, the Father himself loves you. When you feel a little down, you just plug your name into that word there. The Father himself loves me. And to think of what a marvelous thing that is, the greatest heart in the universe, beating out love to you every moment of the day. Number three, we don't need to repeatedly beg him to help us either. Yes, Jesus talks about this idea that some people think that God will hear them for their often asking, for repeatedly asking. Some religions actually have little prayer wheels in which every time the little wheel goes round, supposedly another prayer goes up to heaven. Many people have ritualistic repeated words or sticking a prayer in the wall, the wailing wall, hoping that as long as it's there, it's efficacious, as if somehow God has to be begged over and over again. But the Lord Jesus said that is not true for, what's the why? For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. That's in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8. So he's not waiting for us to inform him what we need. Sometimes he actually answers before we ask. He's wanting us to ask, not because he needs that information, but because he wants us in an intimate conversation with him. Number four, your father wants you to be as forgiving as he is. Any idea how many sins I've been forgiven of by my father? No idea. But he says, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, then the father won't forgive you. And how does that actually play out? Well, when I go to him for forgiveness, 
he responds by saying something like, well, that's an interesting concept. I understand you have some forgiving to do. What do you say? You go and make that right with them and then come and see me. And so the Father wants us to take forgiveness seriously because that's what frees us from that failure. Even if someone has done something to me, as long as I don't forgive them, I've chained myself to that event. And that's where bitterness can spring up. So he wants me to be set free, and so he puts me into that situation so that I also can receive forgiveness from him. Number five, your father is the most generous person in the universe. It's true, isn't it? I think very often we think that God is a reluctant giver, but he's not. Uh, the scripture says every good and perfect gift, that is every good gift, and every perfect act of giving. He not only gives good things, he gives them in a good way. They are from above, come down from the Father of Lights. Now this is an astronomy term. The Father of Lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. These are two scientific terms, two astronomical terms. A parallax and eclipse. A parallax is the apparent shift due to my movement on the earth as to where the positioning of the stars are. So, in other words, when I move, my position moves with them. And, of course, eclipse means that something gets in the way between us. So, my father never changes his position towards me. Whether I change or not, whether I get up grumpy one day or not, he doesn't respond in kind. He is the constant in my life. He never changes. I am the Lord. I change not. And also, nothing can ever get between me and him because he is the omnipresent one. He is with me and in me. And so, this beautiful picture of the Father of Lights, we know that everything comes from the light. All the food we eat, the strength we have, the warmth we have, the illumination to see, it all comes from the light. And so he's seen as the source of everything. All the life, all the joy, all the beauty, it all comes from him. Nothing can ever get in the way of him doing this. And nothing can ever distort my position relative to him because of my moving. He's always there. We notice this in our own hearts when we've gone away from the Lord taken step after step after step away from the Lord, we think when I turn around, it'll be a long way back to him. But the minute I turn around, he's right there because he's been following me into the desert. And the hymn writer said, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, Jesus is here to comfort and hear just when I need him most. The Father himself loves you and he tracks us. And no matter what happens to us, we're always just a prayer away from the Father. Number six, in spite of all he has, the Father is seeking one thing. I suppose we wonder what that is, right? The Lord Jesus, again, in talking to the woman at the well, he said, the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking such to worship him. The Lord Jesus is seeking laborers to work with him in the building up of the church. The Holy Spirit is seeking sinners, and he invites us into this project with him. So if we want to be involved in the family business, we need to understand that the Spirit is seeking sinners, the Savior is seeking laborers, and the Father is seeking worshipers. Let's be involved with them in the family business. Number seven, when we use the gifts he gives for the good of others, we glorify our Father. What do we have, but we haven't received? So when I'm generous with others, people can track it back. If I give him the glory, they can track it back to God. And that's exactly what the Lord said, that let your light so shine before man that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So when the Father is generous with me, his intention is that I not keep it to myself, 
that I spread it out. In fact, James tells us if you pray and you want the end product to be yourself, God isn't interested in answering that prayer. When we pray, we should be thinking about ways we can share the wealth with others, and then God likes to see that happen. He wants to maximize the blessing. And so he gives us goods so we can share with others, and in the process, God is glorified. That doesn't mean that God likes everyone to be saying, you're amazing, you're wonderful. What he wants is to override the wrong ideas people have about God, that God is a generous father, that God loves people, that he cares. Most people have forgotten that, and we have an opportunity every day of doing good to others and giving him the glory in such a way that people think better of God than they did when we met them. And that's the point of that verse. Number eight, the Father's heart has a loyalty to every one of his creatures. This is an idea that's under assault today, that God is particular about who he loves and who he doesn't love. But the scripture says that he loves the world. And the Lord Jesus made it perfectly clear. And I take the word of Jesus over any theologian any day. Jesus said, it's not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now that's after the story of the 99 sheep. Shouldn't God be happy with 99 out of 100? No. He wants that other one too. That's the heart of God. He says, go into the highways and byways and compel them to come in, for my house must be filled. That's the heart of God towards the human race. And his heart is loyal to every one of his creatures. You see that in the dialogue between Jonah and God. When Jonah says, give it to them, and the Lord says, give it to them, they repented. And Jonah says, I knew you were like that. Well, Jonah was all bent out of shape about this biodegradable umbrella that had withered away. And God says, you didn't plant it, you didn't water it, you didn't care for it, and yet you're all upset about this. Look at those people down there. I know the little children that get up in the morning and don't know which foot to put which sandal on. And I have a loyalty to them. I can't just, in, in fact, I care about the cattle. So God has a loyalty to his creatures. And if there's anything God can do to righteously save a person, the Father will find a way to do it. Number nine. The Father has really big plans for every one of his children. <laughs> you know, in the Bible, when a king was feeling especially generous, usually when he'd had a few drinks at a party, he would offer up to half of the kingdom. In other words, 49% interest in the kingdom. We read that in the story of Esther and the story of Herodias' daughter, up to half of the kingdom. But here's what the Lord Jesus said, Fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, the whole thing. That's Luke 12, 32. So when we think about the generosity of the heart of God, he does exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. Sometimes people treat God the way they are, and they treat God to be stingy, and they say things like, oh, your wife's going to get a lot of your reward, or your children, or the people who support you, as if God is slicing up the reward someday. He's looking for ways to give it away. If you give a cold drink to anyone in the name of a disciple, he says it won't lose its reward. If you receive a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, you'll receive a righteous man's reward. So he's looking for ways to show his generosity to us. Let's take advantage of God's large heartedness so that we will have more than enough to spread it to others and convince them how loving and wonderful our God really is. Lastly, number 10, the Father also has one gift above all gifts he wants believers to enjoy. He's already given the Son in order that we might be reconciled to him and have this intimate relationship with him as Father. And let's never forget those beautiful words the Lord Jesus said to Mary after his resurrection, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. What an astounding thing that is, that 
although the relationship is different, the relationship is real. And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the cross? So that he could now say to Mary, he's my God and your God. He's my father and your father. But the Lord says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He's called the promise of the father. And the Father's desire is to fill the universe with the glory of Christ. And what he's going to do is use the Holy Spirit within us to include us in that project so that our lives are reflections of the beauty of Christ. Christ was the curse bearer, the sin bearer, the judgment bearer. God wants him to be the glory bearer. He says, I'll hang on him all my glory and the role of the Holy Spirit is to take of the things of Christ and show them to us. So the gift of the Father to every believer is the Holy Spirit as we yield to him, as we receive his influence into our lives so that the Holy Spirit magnifies Christ and Christ magnifies the Father so that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are glorified in the universe as they rightly deserve to be.